our session today is focused on delaying age-related eye disease through nutrition. And we're going to hear from Dr. Sheldon Rowan and Kelsey Smith. As I begin to transition to the introduction for Dr. Rowan, um, I do want to note that we are in a really unique position to hear from both the senior investigator as well as the graduate student, which I always think is really exciting to be able to incorporate and include um, younger and earlier career scientists within our program offering. So with that, let me give a brief introduction on Sheldon as I also transfer the presentation mode. So Dr. Sheldon Rowan is a scientist with the nutrition and vision team at the Jean Mayer Human Nutrition Research Center on Aging at Tufts University. He researches the role of dietary patterns in the development of age-related macular degeneration and its relationship to aging metabolism and the gut microbiome. He's engaged in exciting work that's revealing how eye health can be directly affected by changes in the gut microbiome. He's assistant professor of ophthalmology at Tufts University School of Medicine and an assistant professor of nutrition at the Friedman School of, for Nutrition and Science Policy. He earned his PhD in genetics from Harvard University. So please, Sheldon. Okay, hopefully everyone can see my screen okay? So we can see it, but you're not in presenter mode. There we go, perfect. Okay, excellent. I am really excited um, to share this presentation and thank you so much to IFINS um, for this opportunity. Um, this is such a fundamental part of um, what we do is not just the research, but also the communication of our findings um, to a diverse audience. Um, I just want to begin with my disclosures, um, mostly grant research support. I don't have um, any other disclosures to mention. So here's the outline of the talk I'll be giving today. Um, first, I'm going to begin with an overview of the visual system. Um, and then I'll be telling you a little bit about kind of um, age-related eye diseases and the urgency and the need for us to study these. And then I'll take you through four different um, diseases. I'll begin with um, cataracts. Um, then I'll move on to glaucoma, diabetic retinopathy, and finally, the bulk of the presentation will be on age-related macular degeneration, um, which is really the research that um, I do in my group and that you'll hear about um, this afternoon. Um, so I, I think it's always good for everybody to get um, on the same page about um, how the visual system works and the different parts of the eye that I'm going to be referring to. Um, shown here is a front view of the eye, and then in diagram form, we have the side view of the eye. Um, and the things that I want to draw your attention to, um, without going through the full anatomy, um, is just kind of like the pathway of light. Um, so light begins in the outside. It's going to first interact with our cornea, um, where it's going to go um, through the cornea, which is a transparent structure, um, and then into the lens. Um, and I highlight the lens here because um, cataracts are really an opacity of the lens. Um, and then the lens has the job of focusing the light on the back of the eye, um, which is our neural retina. And the neural retina is responsible for all of the um, conversion of that light into the actual signals that will go um, out eventually through the optic nerve head um, into the brain where visual processing occurs. Um, one of the things I wanna draw your attention to, which I'll mention more in the context of macular degeneration, is that one of the jobs of the lens is to focus the light on actually a fairly small part of the back of the eye of the neural retina called the macula, where we have most of our clear color vision. Um, and then here's the problem with age-related eye diseases. There's an extremely high prevalence and a high burden of them. Um, so what I'm showing here is that um, right now, we look at Americans, uh, individuals age 40 plus, um, when we think about age-related eye diseases. Um, and there's more than 50 million Americans that are either blind, visually impaired, 
or have an age-related eye disease. Um, that's a huge number of individuals. It's at a huge economic cost to the nation. Um, and concerningly, as you might expect for an age-related eye disease, um, the prevalence is increasing. Um, what I wanna show here are rates of four different diseases um, and how they increase by age and by sex. Um, you could see even, um, again, individuals 40 to 49, which is me and I don't view myself as that old, but um, there are eye diseases starting to develop within um, this age group. And it just keeps going up exponentially. Um, and then you could also notice there is a bit of a sex difference. Um, females, especially older um, females, are at higher risk for age-related eye diseases. Um, I mentioned to you that I'll be mostly discussing these um, four major age-related eye diseases, glaucoma, diabetic retinopathy, age-related macular degeneration, and cataract. Um, my slides have stopped moving. Can anyone see? Sorry, let me try. Yeah, okay. try and relaunch it. Perfect. Yeah. So age-related eye diseases across the board are increasing. Um, this is data from the National Eye Institute kind of showing you within the United States um, what the numbers look like from 2010 and what we're expecting them to become in 2050. Um, so you could see that a lot of these diseases are already present within the millions. Um, in the case of cataracts, um, the tens of millions, and the number is increasing quite dramatically. Um, I wanna draw your attention to the fact that cataracts, um, which I'll be discussing first, are extremely prevalent. Um, in the United States, um, they're not a leading cause of blindness, but worldwide they are. Um, so it's a great interest, not just here, but also abroad. Um, in the United States, we worry most about age-related macular degeneration, which is a leading cause of vision loss for individuals over 65 years of age. Um, so the first disease I'm gonna talk about are cataracts, which is caused by an opacification of the lens um, shown up here. Um, and this is what a really bad cataract looks like um, in an individual. You can see that the lens um, is always a beautiful crystalline um, object, but it's usually transparent. In this case, it looks more like an actual crystal. Um, and it's pretty obvious um, how that would impact on vision. Um, so what are the different symptoms of cataracts? Um, here's what normal vision would look like, and here's what vision could, like with, could look like after a cataract. Um, so the main features are blurry, dim, or cloudy vision, um, glare or sensitivity to lights. This is a really big problem. You can kind of see here schematically um, how glare might happen from a cataract where the light, instead of getting transmitted through the lens, um, suddenly um, goes off in all kinds of different directions. Um, this causes huge problems with, say, night driving. Um, there's also difficulty in seeing colors with reading, um, and some individuals have double or triple vision. The prevalence of cataract increases exponentially with age, um, to the point where if you follow this graph beginning at a fairly low prevalence in adults 40 to 49, um, by the time you look at individuals over the age of 80, um, the prevalence is almost 70%, and about 30% of people have already had an artificial lens replacement, which is the standard of care um, here for cataracts. I think if you were to continue to extrapolate, you could imagine that um, most individuals, if they lived long enough, would develop a cataract. Um, so when we think about kind of the role for research and nutrition, um, we're not so much interested in saying, do we, how do we prevent cataracts from developing, period, but maybe how can we delay a cataract between five years or 10 years? That would have an enormous impact. Um, and this has been studied for decades. Um, cataracts are one of the first diseases that we really thought about could there be a role for nutrition in um, preventing cataract formation? Um, and what I have here are kind of a summary from a lot of nutritional epidemiology, um, where we've kind of identified what the major vitamins and nutrients are that seem to be protective for cataracts. So I'm gonna draw your attention to vitamin C, vitamin E, vitamin A, and as well, um, this large class of carotenoids um, alpha, beta carotene, um, beta cryptoxanthin, lutein, and zeaxanthin. Um, these may be compounds you're not as familiar with the names of, but you're familiar with their impacts on 
their contribution to the colors and vibrancy of fruits and vegetables. And this is why we always talk about um, encouraging people to consume fruits and vegetables that have these bright um, colors. And then what I'm showing here are the cumulative results from the epidemiology, um, looking at the risk for cataracts based on the intake of these vitamins and nutrients or the status. Um, status is the amount that's actually circulating in the blood. Um, and just um, to orient everyone and kind of how we think about the epidemiology, these are relative risk values. Um, so relative risk of one um, means no change between consuming or not consuming it or consuming the most versus the least. Um, a value of less than one would indicate a protective role for that nutrient and greater than one um, would be increased risk for the disease. And what you can see is for various degrees, um, all of these vitamins and carotenoids are associated with a lower risk for cataract, um, both based on asking, uh, determining how much intake individuals had of these or what their actual status of the vitamins are or the carotenoids. Um, but I'll caution you that the way epidemiologists do this study is they look at the individuals that have the highest intake or status compared to the lowest intake or status. Um, so the same thing that this data indicates that having more of it could be beneficial. Um, the alternative is really it's the individuals that are insufficient that are at greatest risk for cataract development. And this is supported um, in data where people try to supplement with all of these um, great vitamins and carotenoids, um, basically unsuccessfully. So what I'm showing here are summaries of epidemiological studies um, looking here for vitamin E um, or for beta carotene. And you can see that if you take individuals that are already replete with these vitamins or um, carotenoids and you give them more, um, there isn't any ability for addition of them by supplementation um, to prevent cataracts. So when we look at the relative risk, it's extremely close to one. Um, and from a statistical sense, um, there's no um, meaningful changes here. So here are the conclusions for this first part of the seminar about cataracts. Um, the main thing I want you to take home is the idea of getting sufficient vitamins, um, sufficient carotenoids, preferably from fruits and vegetables. Um, we don't have any reason to think that getting them from supplements um, wouldn't be just as effective. Um, Reminder that there's no benefit to having more than the daily recommended amount, um, at least as far as what we can detect in our experiments. Um, there will always be individuals that think um, if vitamin C is great, then more vitamin C is better. Um, we, we don't really have data to support that. The next disease I'm going to talk about is glaucoma. Um, and glaucoma um, affects two different parts of the eye. So I'll briefly tell you a little bit about the disease. Um, glaucoma is caused by a buildup of intraocular pressure within the eye. So the eye normally has its own pressure um, to keep its shape and form, um, and this is controlled by fluids at the front of the eye. Um, so it's important that fluids are produced and drained at the right ratio. Um, if the fluids don't get drained appropriately, um, you could develop glaucoma. Um, there's two forms. Um, there's an open angle form, which is the most common form, and a closed angle form, which is less common, but far more dangerous and usually requires immediate intervention. And the consequence of this buildup of intraocular pressure over time is that the neurons in the retina at the back of the eye undergo degeneration. And specifically the ones whose axons go out through the optic nerve here connecting to the brain. Um, so with time, glaucoma will lead to blindness. Um, it's an interesting pattern of blindness. It's more um, obvious effect on the peripheral vision. Um, this has to do with different aspects about the geometry of the retina itself. Um, so an individual with glaucoma um, would lose a lot of the peripheral vision around this image. Um, I mentioned to you the biggest risk factor for glaucoma is increased intraocular pressure. Um, I wanted to share you um, the results of this study because um, I think it's so dramatic and so obvious why we need to keep checking our pressure every time we go to visit an optometrist or an ophthalmologist. Um, so a healthy intraocular pressure is maybe about 12 or 13 here. Um, and there's a very low rate of um, glaucoma until you hit about 20 milligrams of mercury, in which case the incidence of glaucoma begins to skyrocket. 
Um, in terms of how we treat glaucoma, um, the best approach for especially individuals at an earlier stage of disease um, are topical antihypertensive treatments, which can often be delivered via eye drops. Um, here's the results of a study looking at um, individuals who are either given medication or um, given a placebo um, on rate of developing um, glaucoma, you could see that individuals that weren't medicated um, ended up developing glaucoma at a much higher rate. Um, so this is an effective treatment. Um, in some cases, though, if glaucoma continues to progress, um, it may require surgical interventions. Um, so just to conclude this part, um, you notice I haven't spent a lot of time talking about the role for nutrition in glaucoma. Um, the reason for that is that we don't actually have a lot of data um, showing connections between diet, nutrition, and glaucoma. Um, but I do want to let you know that there is some epidemiology um, that points to um, a benefit for increased amounts of dark leafy green vegetables. Um, and they hypothesized that these dark leafy green vegetables may be high in nitrates, um, which could actually work to help um, control intraocular pressure. Um, but the main take home message I'd want to leave you with is um, to have the intraocular pressure checked regularly. Um, the biggest um, external factor for increased in intraocular pressure um, is steroid usage. So especially individuals that may be taking steroids to control other conditions um, should really um, keep an eye on their intraocular pressure. The next disease I'll be discussing is diabetic retinopathy. Um, in contrast to the cataracts and glaucoma, um, diabetic retinopathy is really a vascular disease. So I'm highlighting um, these blood vessels that grow throughout the retina. Um, and as you might expect from the name, um, this is highly connected to diabetes. So how does diabetic retinopathy affect vision? Um, it can present in a lot of different ways. Um, so some individuals with like a very advanced form of diabetic retinopathy um, may lose vision in these very specific patches within the eye. And um, this would be associated with, for example, um, blood leakage directly um, in parts of the retina leading to um, retinal degeneration in these areas and kind of focal loss of vision. Um, but more frequently, um, it presents as, you know, a loss of clarity in the vision. And the biggest risk factor for developing diabetic retinopathy is long duration and poorly controlled diabetes. Um, so the longer you have diabetes in life and the worse controlled it is, the greater the risk you have of developing diabetic retinopathy. Um, and almost half of diabetic individuals have some kind of diabetic retinopathy, either an earlier or later form of the disease. So um, what are our treatment options for diabetic retinopathy? Um, the best treatment is very intensive glycemic regulation. And what do I mean by intensive glycemic regulation? I mean some combination of medications, diet, and exercise. Um, and this will be you know, as prescribed by a physician. Um, now I want to show you a little bit about um, how diet um, can play a role in this and what kind of impact these um, modifications on glycemic regulation can have on diabetic retinopathy. Um, one aspect that is worthwhile to introduce now um, is the concept of a high glycemic versus a low glycemic index food. Um, and this is important for controlling your blood sugar. So a high glycemic index food examples are shown here, um, leads to a rapid increase in blood glucose levels after consumption, um, whereas a low glycemic index food leads to lower blood glucose levels after eating that food. Um, so a recommended diet might be one that has a low glycemic index. And here's the impact of these um, intensive glycemic regulations on the actual amount of blood sugar. And this is measured by a measure called glycosylate hemoglobin, which some of you may be familiar with as HbA1c, which kind of looks over time at the impact of elevated blood glucose. Um, and diabetic individuals have quite high amounts of HbA1c, um, but with intensive treatment, um, that could be reduced down to maybe greater than a typical um, normal glycemic individual, but um, much better controlled. And it has a really strong impact on development of diabetic retinopathy. So in this study, um, they looked at intensive glycemic regulation in prevention of diabetic retinopathy. Um, so these were people given kind of conventional advice, which would include diet and exercise, or this intensive glycemic regulation had a really reduction in development of diabetic retinopathy. 
And as a secondary study, they also looked about um, progression of diabetic retinopathy to a more severe blinding form. Um, intensive glycemic regulation also had um, quite a dramatic improvement on that. Um, so the take-home messages about diabetic retinopathy would really be um, focusing on medication, diets, and exercise to control um, the blood glucose levels. Um, that's our, our best approach is really kind of a prevention approach. Um, finally, I want to um, wrap up with um, age-related macular degeneration, um, which is, again, the focus of my research and the area where I think we have the most promise and excitement about diet and nutrition. Um, so going back to our diagram of the visual path again, the light path, um, remember that um, our goal is to get light to focus in the macula, this one area in the back of the eye that's responsible for most of our um, high quality, sharp color vision. Now, what does macular degeneration look like? Um, I want to first show you kind of what it looks like within the eye itself. So these are photographs of the back of the eye of the retina. Um, just to orient you to these photographs, you could see the blood vessels very nicely. And this disc here is the optic nerve head. This is where the axons from ganglion cells exit the eye and go to the brain. And the macula is a small region here, but you could already see that it's, um, it looks different than other parts of the eye. It has such a high metabolic and vascular activity. So this is a normal, healthy individual. In age-related macular degeneration, um, what happens is that we start to accumulate drusen in the area of the macula. Um, the drusen you could see are these yellow spots. Um, and the best way to think about them is a form of cellular debris. Um, this is something that happens in most individuals with aging. Um, but in the disease form, the drusen start to form preferentially in the macular region. And you could see in this late form of the disease, um, the entire macula has now been kind of covered in these very large drusen. Um, so this individual would probably already have quite severe visual loss. I also want to mention that there's two forms of macular degeneration um, some of you may be familiar with. Um, what I'm kind of schematizing here in these diagrams is the dry form of the disease. We call it dry because there isn't an obvious role for the vasculature in it. Um, there's also another form of the disease called wet AMD, um, also known as choroidal neovascularization. Um, and this form of the disease, which is more dramatic and more blinding, um, blood vessels from behind the eye um, start to penetrate into the retina um, and they leak killing off the photoreceptors that we need for vision. Um, so this individual here would probably have quite severe vision loss. Um, this is what it might look like um, kind of in a diagrammatic form. You would lose the central vision um, and this is called a scotoma. And you can see even outside of the central vision, um, there's a lot of deterioration of visual quality. Um, but I always think it's, it's more impactful to ask, how does someone with age-related macular degeneration see the world? Um, and I think the best way to look at that is to look at the world through the eyes of an artist that has macular degeneration. Um, so this is a painting by an artist named Anne Rufton called Morning Sight. Um, and what you could see is this kind of like beautiful impressionistic pastoral but here's her scotoma. Um, and you can see that there's complete loss of clarity of any visual information through there. Um, so um, this artist and individuals with advanced macular degeneration become blind. Um, and it's a very debilitating disease that um, strips away independence and quality of life. Um, what are the risk factors for age-related macular degeneration? Um, as I've already told you before, and as the name would kind of suggest, Aging is the largest risk factor. Um, every five years, there's about a 42% increase in the risk. Um, there's not much we could do about that. We like to age. So um, this is an uncontrolled um, risk factor for macular degeneration. But there are also environmental and genetic risk factors. Um, so the most um, easily identifiable environmental form is smoking, um, where that could lead to about a threefold risk for age-related macular degeneration. Um, there's also a genetic risk component for macular degeneration. Um, these are based on common gene variants in genes that are involved in the immune system and in lipid handling. Um, and if you were unlucky enough to get born with a um, bad combination of these variants, you might have a two to three fold increased risk for macular degeneration. Um, 
What first got me interested about the idea of a connection to diet was the finding that obesity in itself, um, high BMI, can lead to a large increase in risk for macular degeneration. Um, and so um, one of my larger research interests in that um, in the field is this question about how might diet affect our risk for macular degeneration? And specifically, what would happen to individuals that are sticking to a very healthy diet, like a Mediterranean dietary pattern here, um, high in fruits, vegetables, um, fish, olive oil, for example, um, versus an individual that's adhering to the more traditional Western dietary pattern, um, which I, this picture is delicious, but it's really terrible for you. It's full of fried foods and red meats and processed foods. Um, unfortunately, this is what most of us do eat. And I want to um, draw your attention to the study that was published a couple of years ago um, that looked at um, the impact of adherence to a Mediterranean diet on risk for advanced macular degeneration. Um, this is a European study. And what they did is they divided up individuals based on their adherence to the Mediterranean diet. So in red are individuals that really didn't have a very Mediterranean diet-like pattern. Um, and you can see that with aging, there has, there's this exponential increased risk for macular degeneration. But the individuals shown in green here that actually did kind of eat a Mediterranean dietary pattern, um, that increase in time kind of flatlined. Um, and this leads to quite a dramatic decreased overall risk for advanced macular degeneration, um, which is really the form we want to prevent. This is the form that leads to most blindness. Um, and so epidemiology from a large number of different cohorts has kind of shown this time and time again. Um, this is data from a review that, um, that my group recently published, um, where we looked at multiple different kinds of healthy dietary patterns. So I mentioned to you the Mediterranean diet. Um, there's also the Healthy Eating Index, um, which is developed in the United States. And there's also this general concept of the prudent dietary pattern. Um, the prudent dietary pattern would be um, high intake of fruits, vegetables, whole grains, um, low fat, um, poultry, low fat dairy, et cetera. And all of these healthy dietary patterns show um, a decreased risk for macular degeneration. In some cases, you know, a two to four fold reduced risk for developing age-related macular degeneration. Um, and you could contrast that with the Western dietary pattern, um, which has quite an elevated risk for disease, um, which is actually fairly analogous to the risks associated with smoking. Um, and we wanted to know um, what aspects about these healthy dietary patterns are associated with protection um, from AMD progression. Um, this is um, taken from a study that was just published um, in ophthalmology. And it's very consistent with a lot of epidemiological findings in the field of age-related macular degeneration. Um, what we find is that vitamins and minerals and other kinds of nutrients that are associated with fruits, vegetables, whole grains, et cetera, um, are all associated with protection from AMD progression. Whereas um, fats, cholesterols that are associated with a high fat diet or with eating a lot of red meat or fried foods are associated with increased risk for AMD progression. Um, and I'll mention to you kind of a special call out to fish, um, which has been uniquely identified as particularly protective for macular degeneration. Um, and the fatty acids present at high amounts in fish like EPA, DHA, um, also show a protection against AMD progression. And um, I'm showing you one result, but this is you know, the combination of decades of epidemiology. And it led to this hypothesis. Um, what if we take some of these vitamins and minerals um, that are associated with protection from macular degeneration, and we think about combining them as a supplement? Is there any potential to prevent AMD progression. Um, and so these are the ones I want to highlight, vitamin E, vitamin C, um, lutein and zeaxanthin, if you remember, this is in the class of carotenoids, and zinc and copper. And the National Eye Institute began a study several years ago called the ARIDS um, study, where they asked whether supplements containing these vitamins and carotenoids at high levels could prevent AMD progression. The first iteration of this, just called ARIDS, has high amounts of vitamin C, vitamin E, zinc, copper, beta carotene. 
um, you could see led to about a 25% risk reduction for macular degeneration. Um, we've since updated the formulation to replace the beta carotene with lutein and zeaxanthin, um, which are both safer and kind of more natural products that are enriched in the back of the eye. Um, and the ARIDS-2 supplement offers the same kind of protection against AMD progression. Um, so now I want to shift a little bit and talk about um, the research that I'm involved in and its relationship to diet. And we're interested in this idea that um, within the dietary patterns, the Western diet is characterized by high glycemic index. And whereas Mediterranean diets and other prudent dietary patterns are associated with a lower glycemic index. Um, and what we found from a large number of epidemiological findings is that a high glycemic index diet increases the risk for both early and late macular degeneration. Um, you can see the odds ratios are somewhere between one and threefold increased risk for the disease. Um, and I was particularly interested in asking, how can we take this epidemiological finding and convert it into maybe a mechanistic understanding and how diet actually can prevent macular degeneration? Um, and so what I did is I developed um, an animal model to study and these um, questions in, um, they wouldn't be possible to do in, in humans. Um, the disease develops over such a long period of time. Um, so we developed um, an animal study um, involving aging, where we take mice and age them from one year to two years eating different diets. Um, and we tested diets that are either a low glycemic diet or a high glycemic diet. And the only difference between these diets is the makeup of the starches in them. So the high glycemic diet is rapidly converted into blood glucose, um, whereas the low glycemic starch here containing a lot of amylose um, is digested much slower into glucose. Um, hence adjusting the dietary glycemic index without any other aspects of the dietary quality. And we included an intervention group where after six months of feeding a high glycemic diet, we shifted them to a low glycemic diet. And what happened to the eyes? Um, the low glycemic diet, you could see here, the eye looks perfectly healthy. Um, after a year of feeding a high glycemic diet, um, this animal develops um, visual problems. Um, it, you could see, here that the eye is not healthy. It develops all kinds of lesions and damage. And to our um, approximation, this is you know, a good mouse model for age-related macular degeneration. Um, and we were really excited to find that shifting from a high to a low glycemic diet, you recall we did this um, midway through our aging, so at 18 months, was actually able to completely prevent the eye from developing disease. Um, so we now have experimental evidence in a model system that a low glycemic diet can protect from age-related macular degeneration. Um, I went on to ask a slightly different question. So we know that a low glycemic diet can protect from macular degeneration, but what about in a model that's um, genetically predisposed to develop this disease? Um, and this is relevant, you know, when I mentioned to you that there are these genetic risk factors. So I worked in a particular animal model. This is a knockout of a gene called NRF2. Um, when you're missing NRF2, you have more oxidative damage, um, which can in some cases accelerate disease formations. What we found is that in a high glycemic diet, again, a high glycemic diet would lead to an increase in glucose um, concentration. Um, over time, we developed this very advanced form of um, dry age-related macular degeneration. Um, but even in this um, mouse model, um, a low glycemic index diet was able to maintain a healthy eye. Um, and we were able to um, use different molecular characterizations in these models to get some mechanistic understanding of what the protective effects might be. Um, so for example, a low glycemic diet has a reduced amount of glycation. Um, what is glycation? It's an actual um, process by which um, high amounts of sugar molecules can modify proteins. Um, and lead to cellular toxicity. So the high glycemic diet has more glycation than the low glycemic diet. Um, and conversely, there's other benefits to a low glycemic diet that increase their ability to detoxify um, damage to the back of the eye. Um, so this is a big focus of my research, is kind of understanding how does a high glycemic diet lead to age-related macular degeneration and how is that prevented by a low glycemic index diet? So to conclude this part of the talk, um, I want to remind everyone that healthy dietary patterns 
like the Mediterranean diet and a low glycemic diet are associated with a lower risk for macular degeneration. Um, these dietary benefits work even in individuals who are at higher risk for AMD because of genetics. And this has been shown in human studies as well as in my mouse studies. Um, and now that we have these animal studies and these dietary relationships, we can start getting mechanistic insight into how exactly diet can protect from age-related macular degeneration. And I want to use this as kind of a springboard um, to these really interesting findings um, that we have that there's a role for the gut microbiome in these dietary relationships. And I'm not going to talk about this any further because you're going to get a whole seminar on this from my PhD student, Kelsey Smith, who's going to speak following me, um, especially about um, research and microbiome and her research. So here are the two takeaway messages I want to leave you with. Um, one is a reminder to have a dilated eye examination at least every two years. Um, and the other is to think about following a healthy dietary pattern that you actually like and will actually eat. Um, and I want to um, do a shout out right now um, to a project that we do at the Human Nutrition Research Center on Aging called My Plate for Older Adults, um, where we've developed a dietary pattern that's really specifically geared for older adults. Um, this looks just like a prudent dietary pattern and overlaps a lot with the Mediterranean diet. Um, and I encourage all of you um, to look into that more if you're interested. So with that, I'm going to conclude um, and I will transfer this back to Wendelin. One second. Actually, Sheldon, what we're going to do is we're going to pass this directly on to Kelsey. So while Kelsey is coming on and getting ready to pull up her presentation, I'll do a very, very brief intro and note that Kelsey's a PhD student at the Friedman School of Nutrition Science and Policy at Tufts University. She is on course to graduate from the Biochemical and Molecular Nutrition Program in 2022. Her research focuses on the role of the intestinal microbiome in the development of age-related macular degeneration phenotype in aged mice fed a high or low glycemic index diet. Kelsey earned her master's in animal science from the University of Kentucky and her bachelor's from Cornell. In 2020, she was recipient of the HNRCA's Gerald Cassidy Student Research Award, and she is already building a solid foundation of publications as she is the lead author or co-author on six papers since 2019. So with that, Kelsey, tell us about your work. Thank you so much for the introduction. Um, let's get started. All right, so as Sheldon um, said, I will be speaking today on the role of the gut microbiome in mediating the relationship between diet and eye disease. Um, I have no conflicts of interest and these are my funding sources. So just to go over what we'll be speaking about today or what I'll be speaking about today, I'm going to begin by uh, just briefly explaining what is the gut microbiome, what is the function of the gut microbiome and how do we study it? Then I'll go into how does the diet influence the gut microbiome. Then I'll be discussing does the gut microbiome affect eye health. And I'll finish with what is the future of gut microbiome eye research. So what is the microbiome? The microbiome is defined as all of the genetic material of all microbes, so bacteria, viruses, archaea, and fungi living in a specific site. So there are around 10 to 100 trillion microbes living on and in our bodies, and 95% of those microbes are found in the GI tract. Um, microbiome genes outnumber host genes in humans 150 to 1. Over 10,000 different species have been identified in and on humans, and each human's microbiome is as unique as a fingerprint. <clears throat> 
There are multiple microbiomes of the human body. Anywhere the human body interfaces with the exterior environment, you'll find microbes. So this includes the surface of the eye, it includes the mouth, the GI tract, the skin, the urogenital tract, and even into breast tissue. The gut microbiome has wide ranging effects on the host. So here on the left, we have functions of microbes. They can ferment dietary fibers, which results in short chain fatty acids, which then are taken up by the host and used as an energy source for the cells. They're involved in glucose homeostasis, satiety, cholesterol synthesis, and many, many other functions have been discovered. There are other microbial metabolites that are produced through the metabolism of bile acids, amino acids, and other compounds in the diet, and they have been found to regulate functions throughout the body. Additionally, the gut microbiome interacts with the host immune system, and it can stimulate and regulate host immune function. The gut microbiome can synthesize multiple vitamins, which contributes to the maintenance of host vitamin status. And finally, the commensal or beneficial bacteria in our gut can compete with pathogens, which can prevent intestinal infections. Up to 90% of human disease is associated with the gut microbiome and kind of the general layout of how this can occur. We can have a harmful gut microbiome, which is also known as dysbiosis. And this harmful gut microbiome leads to an increase of inflammatory cytokines, microbial peptides, and metabolites entering host cells and the circulation. And then in those cells and throughout the circulation, they can lead to inflammation, metabolic dysregulation, barrier permeability, and direct cellular signaling, aberrant cellular signaling. This is just looking at some of the associations between microbial metabolites and disease. The green is beneficial microbial metabolites that have shown to promote health. Um, as I mentioned earlier here, short chain fatty acids have a role in obesity, preventing type two diabetes, and even Parkinson's disease. Whereas we have um, harmful microbial metabolites such as TMAO, which is produced from carnitine found in red meat, and it has been associated with cardiovascular disease. So how do we study the gut microbiome? So it begins with collecting the sample. This is usually a uh, fecal sample, but from animal models, we can also collect it directly from the intestine. And one method to explore the gut microbiome is to extract and sequence the DNA found in the sample. This can give us the composition and the diversity of the gut microbiome. And there are three terms here that I wanna define because you might see them frequently in papers on the gut microbiome. The first is alpha diversity. And alpha diversity refers to the diversity of the microbes within a human. So how many different kinds of microbes are there and what is the proportion of the microbes present? Beta diversity refers to the difference or similarity of composition between two different sites. So two different humans or two different treatment groups. Differential abundance refers to taxa that are significantly higher in one group or another group. So this is specific to the taxa, whereas the other two measures were specific to the composition or the overall composition. Through DNA sequencing, we can also get some information on the functional capacity of the gut microbiome. So if we look at the abundance of all genes present, we can get an estimate of what the microbiome has the capacity to do. Um, so if we have an increase of genes responsible for carbohydrate metabolism, for example, we can um, make the assumption that that uh, gut microbiome has increased capacity to metabolize um, carbohydrates. We can also extract the RNA and proteins found in these samples. And this would give us an idea of what is the microbiome actually doing or what is the phenotype? What um, genes are being expressed and which genes are being translated into proteins. And we do this through terms called metatranscriptomics and metaproteomics. Finally, and perhaps most relevant for host health is metabolomics. So we can look at all the metabolites present in the sample. And metabolites are compounds produced by the microbiome that are then excreted into the surrounding environment and can be taken up by the host. 
how does the diet impact the gut microbiome? We can see here on this figure on the left that there are many factors that determine the composition of the microbiome, anything from age to the household and the family to the diet or medication use, and then also intrinsic factors such as sex or genetics. Here on the right is a figure, oops, sorry, is a figure just looking at the effects of different nutrients on the gut microbiome. Diet is a major determinant of composition. And this is simply uh, three different types of fat were fed to rats. And you can see an expansion of the firmicutes in different treatment groups. They're subtle. Um, the microbiome is relatively resistant and are resistant to change. Um, and you might see even more subtle effects in human studies. This is due to the, all these other factors controlling the gut microbiome. However, subtle effects can still have significant effects on phenotypes. So I'm going to be going over different nutrients and dietary patterns and how they affect the gut microbiome function. So a high fat diet leads to changes in the presence and the number of the species in the gut microbiome. You may have heard if you're familiar with gut microbiome research of acromantia, which is generally um, considered to be a beneficial taxa, additionally bacteroidetes. And we have a decrease in these uh, species while consuming a high fat diet. And this decrease in these species leads to an increase of long chain fatty acid synthesis by the microbiome, an increase of lipopolysaccharide, which is a compound in the cell wall of microbes that leads to inflammation in people. And we also have an increase of inflammatory cytokines. So this is generally an overall inflammatory diet. Red meat also leads to changes in the composition and function of the microbiome. So we can see these are species that are up or down regulated. And then the compounds present in meat, such as amino acids and carnitine, um, are metabolized by the gut microbiome and lead to what is generally harmful metabolites, such as TMAO um, and carnitine. Finally, a high fiber diet provides substrate for the um, microbes to consume, and it promotes the uh, expansion of beneficial bacteria. And these beneficial bacteria produce many good metabolites, including short-chain fatty acids, which, as I mentioned previously, have beneficial effects throughout the body. An additional thing, a compound that you might find present in the diet is phytonutrients. Sheldon touched on this earlier, such as lutein and zeaxanthine. Um, consumption of these polyphenols has been shown to um, alter the microbiome in multiple ways. So it changes the metabolism of the microbiome. It can have a specific probiotic effect where it um, increases the amount of beneficial bacteria, such as acromantia. It can have a community-wide prebiotic effect where it improves both the diversity and the abundance of beneficial bacteria. And it can actually have an antimicrobial effect on known pathogens. And all of these changes have been associated with improved health outcomes in humans, including regulating lipid metabolism and reducing the risk of obesity. Many of the known relationships between diet and disease are mediated by the gut microbiome. So here we have a very simple model where a unhealthy diet leads to disease. And we might wonder, is that unhealthy diet leading to gut dysbiosis, which then leads to disease? And there's a few ways that we can explore this. One is to simply eliminate the gut microbiome and see if we still have this disease. There's two ways um, that are frequently used to eliminate the microbiome in experimental models. One is through the use of oral broad spectrum antibiotics. And another is to create a sterile germ-free mouse. And just to go over a quick example, um, this is a pretty well-established model where a high-fat diet leads to obesity in um, conventional normal mice. But if you feed a high-fat diet to a germ-free mouse that doesn't have a gut microbiome, they are protected against obesity. Addition, an additional way that you can explore if there is a causal relationship or a causal effect of the gut microbiome on the relationship between diet and disease is to perform fecal microbiota transplants. So here we have simply a healthy diet leads to a healthy microbiome, which leads to host health. 
Um, and a health, unhealthy diet leads to gut dysbiosis or an unhealthy gut microbiome, which leads to disease. If we transplant healthy bacteria into a mouse or a human receiving an unhealthy diet, can we uh, fix this gut dysbiosis and prevent that disease? And the same goes vice versa. If we transplant from mice receiving an unhealthy diet to mice receiving a healthy diet, do we then overwrite the effect of the healthy diet and lead to disease? And there's many studies that have been performed on this using this technique. Um, one example that I found, so here we have two recipient mice um, groups receiving a high fat diet. Mice that receive a fecal microbiota transplant from other mice receiving a high fat diet get fatty liver disease. But mice receiving a fecal microbiota transplant from mice consuming a high fat diet containing resveratrol are actually protected from liver disease. So how does the gut microbiome affect eye health? So we know that the gut microbiome mediates pathways that are also known to be involved in eye disease. Um, these are just some functions of the gut microbiome. We have bile acid conjugation, regulating systemic inflammation, um, microbial metabolite signaling, and this has effects throughout the body leading to systemic inflammation or increased oxidative stress throughout the body. And these have been known to be lead to eye disease or to leads to inflammation within the eye, increased oxidative stress within the eye, which are implicated in many eye diseases. What is less well understood is, is if there's a direct axis between the gut microbiome and the eye. Like, do we need increased systemic inflammation to have in inflammation in the eye, or do we need obesity to have dyslipidemia in the eye, for example? So this has, um, this is kind of in the nascent stage of this line of research, but there are a few um, studies that have been published showing a relationship or a gut eye axis. And um, these are just some diseases that I'll be going um, over in further detail. So the first I'm going to talk about is age-related macular degeneration. Um, this is from the study that Sheldon was just presenting where we had a low glycemic diet and a high glycemic diet. And the high glycemic diet led to increased phenotypes that are associated or similar to what's observed in people with age-related macular degeneration. And an interesting finding from that study that Sheldon didn't mention is that there was an association of both bacteria, specific taxa of bacteria, and bacterial metabolites with severity of retinal degeneration. So we have Clostridia and Firmicutes that are associated with retina degeneration, whereas we have Erysiplotrichaceae and Bacteroidetes, which are associated with retinal protection. And these also associate with our different diets. And then here on the right, we have co-metabolites that are either strongly associated with um, the, the function of the gut microbiome, or they are directly produced by the gut microbiome. And many of these metabolites are implicated in the development of age-related macular degeneration. This is another model of age-related macular degeneration, and it's specific to the wet AMD um, phenotype. So we, um, it is a laser-induced model in mice, and they found that if you feed these mice that have had the choroidal neovascularization induced a high-fat diet, they have even more severe um, disease. What was really interesting is that they were able to prevent this high-fat diet-induced increase in severity by treating the mice with antibiotics. Additionally, they performed fecal microbiota transplants from mice fed the control diet to mice fed the high fat diet, and they were able to prevent that high fat diet um, induced severity. So this is like very causal um, relationship here showing that the gut microbiome is clearly playing a role. Let me get my slide. Okay. Next, I'm going to be talking about diabetic retinopathy. So this is a study that was looking actually at intermittent fasting. And 
while I talked about how different diets and nutrients can alter the gut microbiome, the timing of meal intake can also um, alter the gut microbiome. And intermittent fasting, where the mice were um, had 24 hours of access to food and 24 hours without food, actually led to a less inflammatory um, gut microbiome. And interesting um, effects of these two different kinds of gut microbiome. So this is um, to toro urso deoxycholate. It is a secondary bile acid that is produced by the gut microbiome. And this uh, dysbiosis leads to a reduction in the production of this bile acid. Whereas the mice receiving the intermittent fasting treatment had an increased production of this bile acid. Now they didn't directly connect this, but there are receptors for this bile acid in the retina, the TGR5 um, receptor. And what they did to try to confirm that this bile acid was playing a role in the diabetic retinopathy prevention or protection is they treated mice with a agonist for that receptor. And they found that compared to the control mice and the diabetic mice, the um, diabetic mice receiving an agonist for that receptor, something that would play the role of the TUDCA, um, had decreased acellular capillaries, which is a phenotype found in diabetic retinopathy. So this, um, they show this association of the gut microbiome with the eye outcome, and they show a potential mechanism, but they're not linking, it, there is not yet established a causal relationship between um, the gut microbiome and diabetic retinopathy. Um, there's also been some research on the role of the gut microbiome in glaucoma. And this is, um, they found that uh, uh, this is a mouse model, the specific genotype is a mouse model for spontaneous glaucoma. But if they have sterile mice of this genotype, they're protected from the glaucomatous neural degeneration. So this is retinal ganglion cell loss. And you can see the germ-free mice here in the gray has significant decrease in um, cell loss, as well as axon loss, a very significant decrease in axon loss in the germ-free mice. So clearly the gut microbiome is mediating this relationship between um, the, well, the genotype in this case and the uh, neural degeneration. Finally, I'm going to be talking about uveitis. So uveitis is um, inappropriate inflammation of the middle layer of the eye. It's most frequently found in the iris, but it's most damaging when it's in the lens, the retina, and optic nerve, um, where it can often lead to blindness. So in immune-mediated and non-infection uveitis is due to both genetic and environmental factors. And um, this particular model, the EAU model, is induced with antigen, leading to inflammation. And what they found in this study was that treating mice with oral antibiotics led to a decrease in the severity of the uveitis. But if they treated mice with those same antibiotics, but intraperitoneal, so direct, directly injecting into the body, they didn't have this protection. So it was an aspect of feeding the antibiotic and likely due to interacting with the gut microbiome that prevented this, um, the severity of the disease. So what is the future of microbiome eye research? There are many knowledge gaps left to be filled. We still need to establish causal relationships between the gut microbiome and eye disease for many of the eye diseases. And then when we do have those causal relationships, we need to determine what are the mechanistic links between the gut microbiome and eye disease. Then we need to evaluate these relationships in female mice and ultimately in humans and um, ensure that they're consistent. And finally, we can use the information that we've gained to develop therapies targeting the gut microbiome. So my PhD research is specifically looking at the causal relationships involved in the gut microbiome and age-related macular degeneration. So um, I performed a feeding trial in 2018 where mice were, control mice were either fed our high glycemic diet, which leads to an AMD-like phenotype, or a low glycemic diet, which is protective against AMD-like phenotype. In one treatment intervention, I performed weekly fecal microbiota transplants from mice fed the opposite diet. 
So mice consuming the high glycemic diet received transplants from mice consuming the low glycemic diet, and mice consuming the low glycemic diet received transplants from mice fed the high glycemic diet. I also performed an intervention where mice were fed oral antibiotics in their diet for the duration of the study. And we have some really exciting findings. Um, we're still working through evaluating the different eye outcomes, but um, it does seem very clear that there is a role for the gut microbiome in the relationship between um, diet and age-related macular degeneration. So stay tuned for that research. So um, I mentioned that we, um, the goal of all this research is to hopefully find preventative or therapies via the gut microbiome. So there's a few different potentials, um, ways that we can modify the gut microbiome to promote health. One um, area is prescriptive diets. I mentioned intermittent fasting might promote a healthier gut microbiome. Um, simply consuming a healthier diet containing high fiber, high phytonutrients, and less red meat may be sufficient to help prevent uh, eye disease. And additionally, targeted prebiotics. So a prebiotic is a nutrient that specifically promotes the expansion of taxa of interest. We also might find probiotics that would improve health outcomes. So a probiotic is a supplement containing a specific strain of a bacteria. There are limitations to probiotics. So one is that different strains have different effects. And so we need to be careful about which strain we are including in our probiotic. Additionally, different bacteria and different strains can have different functions depending on the environment. So if other microbes are present, they might have um, be responding differently or if other, um, if the person is consuming two different diets. So this might be why we haven't seen um, too many studies showing consistent beneficial effects of probiotics is because the environment that we're putting these bacteria into is too diverse. We can also um, create targeted antimicrobials to specifically eliminate only the bacterial taxa that we know are causing problems. And this might take the uh, form of a phage therapy or another very specific antibiotic. Additionally, um, this kind of cutting edge is microbiome gene editing. So instead of eliminating a harmful bacteria, can we eliminate the genes within that bacteria that are actually causing the disease? And finally, postbiotics. So I mentioned many metabolites that are associated with improved health outcomes. One example is short-chain fatty acids. Can we bypass the microbiome and simply treat people with those microbial metabolites? This work is already being explored through the um, treatment of various diseases with short-chain fatty acids, such as butyrate. So that is what I have for you today. Um, and I hope that I was able to clarify any questions you might've had lingering about the gut microbiome, but I'm happy to take more questions. I also want to um, acknowledge our great research team um, led by Dr. Alan Taylor, and of course my advisor, Dr. Sheldon Rowan, um, and then our funding sources are invaluable. So, um, yeah. Great, thanks Kelsey. And if we could have you come back on camera and also ask Sheldon to come back on camera, fantastic. Let me pull up this screen here. Um, I will go through um, a few questions. We've got, actually got quite a few of them coming in, which is always, always very exciting. So let me kind of start a little bit, um, dare I say, at at the top. And this would be, um, I think, a question first for you, um, Sheldon, which is, why is it that females are more affected than males with eye disease, right? That, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, you know, the, the first thing I might suggest is that um, females live older than men do, but I, I showed you by age, there's still an increased rate. Um, and so I don't think we have the full answers to those questions. 
um, there's certainly um, some role for, for different environment in that as well, um, and potentially other roles for sex hormone signaling, but I don't think we really have a full understanding for why there are those differences. Okay, great, thank you. All right, um, let me go to, um, I, we'll give you a rest here briefly, Kelsey, I've got some for you, okay? Um, but, um, Sheldon, there's a question here that you showed reduced cataract risk for each of the four separate carotenoids. Is there evidence of additive risk reduction, i.e. a lower risk than any one of only, the lower risk than only one of the carotenoids if someone eats a diet rich in all four? That's an interesting idea. Um, I didn't go through the carotenoid De, um, data in great detail, um, but people do those kinds of measurements. They look at the individual components and the sum of all of them. Um, they don't actually see any additional benefits. Um, some of that could be because of the fact that we often eat um, those carotenoids together um, in the same foods. Um, but there are some foods that are really rich in lutein and zeaxanthin that don't have um, other carotenoids in them. Um, so there doesn't seem to be that kind of additional benefit, but Again, it's worth remembering that um, we're really looking at the differences between being replete for those versus deficient. Um, so generally, um, it's hard to be deficient in one carotenoid and replete in other carotenoids. So mostly looking at well-nourished individuals. Okay, great. So now this one's gonna go um, perhaps a little bit to, to Kelsey, but also, um, you know, Sheldon, please feel free to jump in on it too, is, um, you know, asking, you know, lots of discussion around the gut microbiome, but there are other microbiomes in the body, right? Um, to include, you know, the skin, right? And even that in the ocular region. And the question is, wouldn't those microbiomes have more direct impact on the eye than the gut microbiome? It's a big question. It's yeah, okay. so yeah, I haven't done too much research on the role of the ocular microbiome. I know that it's being explored for uveitis, especially since uveitis can involve inflammation of the more exterior parts of the eye. Um, I think when we're looking at the retina, and um, it, it would depend on which parts of the organ are more, or of the body are more penetrable by the microbial metabolites. And I think in a lot of ways, the gut microbiome. Um, has easier access to the bloodstream. The body actively takes up many of the compounds produced by the microbiome. And then we also have um, the, the barrier separating the internal part of the intestine with the cell wall and into the circulation. That part can um, is pretty sensitive and become leaky. So while I, I don't know for certain what um, percent effect or what the effect strength would be of the different microbiomes on the eye. Um, there is a very strong connection between the gut microbiome and health that I haven't seen the same kind of strength of connection between other microbiomes and health outcomes. Can I jump in? Um, Absolutely. So, so first of all, I love this question and, and I think Kelsey um, touched on most of the relevant points. Um, as far as the ocular microbiome goes, it's kind of like a very unique, um, it's on the surface of the eye. Um, some people, there's even controversy where some people don't believe there even is a true ocular microbiome. Um, we think there probably is, um, but it's not, you know, the kind of core microbiome that you would see in the gut. Um, it's very different between individuals. And it does seem to be really isolated from the retina. Um, but the one other microbiome um, that we haven't talked about and that might play a role with this is actually the oral microbiome. Um, and this is, um, when you think about um, people with periodontal disease, that's kind of like a dysbiosis of the oral microbiome. Um, and my feeling is that any microbiome that's gonna have systemic effects on say inflammation um, is likely to have an impact on the eye. Um, and so I, I think there is gonna be data coming out kind of connecting the oral microbiome um, with the health of the eye as well. Okay, great, great. Um, so 
talking about kind of kind of building on that a little bit. Um, and I know, Kelsey, you talked about it a bit in your presentation had to do with, I'll, I'll call it the, the um, restriction of calories, right? Okay, the, the, the changes and the, the um, the changes in, in the uh, eating patterns, okay, if you would. Um, so if you want to talk about that and kind of take it out to a restriction on calorie type component. Um, any thoughts around, you know, calorie restrictions and eye disease? And again, it's, any, any comments on that? Um, I believe that our group did research prior to me looking at caloric restriction and iron outcomes. So maybe Sheldon would be a, a better person to answer that question. Um, yeah, so um, so our group showed decades ago um, that caloric restriction um, could help prevent cataract development. Um, this has been really, really tricky to do in, in people. And actually our, our centers led one of the few human studies in caloric restriction, um, but we don't, have you know longitudinal data to really show a connection in, in humans to eye disease, um, but people are interested in, in mouse. So I think outside of cataracts, we don't have data, but um, there would be some idea that maybe caloric restriction would prevent something like age-related macular degeneration. Um, it would also, um, in a diabetic model, would probably be a pretty effective way to prevent um, long-term diabetic complications. So it would probably also help with diabetic retinopathy. Um, and actually, um, there's even data that in glaucoma models, um, that some aspects of caloric restriction um, that affect levels of other kinds of like energy homeostatic nutrients like NAD plus can prevent glaucoma. So there, there's a good chance that it would prevent age-related eye disease. Um, there's a bad chance that this is gonna be the solution in people. It's just so hard for people um, to do long-term caloric restriction. Right, and it probably has multiple factors kind of going into it too. And, you know, part of the scientific process, of course, is you look at one thing and, you know, control all the other variables, et cetera. And that gets complicated with people because we don't always do what we say we're going to do, um, even though we said that we were going to do that. But um, so kind of building on, um, you know, Sheldon, your, your reference there, going back to some diabetic um, type responses there. You know, in, in your research presentation here, you mentioned that um, the glycemic index is a tool to select foods that can help diabetics regulate blood glucose responses, right? Um, and the American Diabetes Association recommends glycemic load as it's a measure since it reflects both the amount and rate of glucose change. And the question is, does, does the eye research tend to look at glycemic load or only the glycemic index? That, that's, a, that's a great question from someone that obviously knows a lot about this. Um, um, the epidemiology um, has divided up, looked at both glycemic index and glycemic load. Um, in most cases, our relationships are quite similar, um, but we have caveats because we often do these experiments by um, analyzing people's um, food intake based on food frequency questionnaires. So we don't often have like very granular data about how much exact um, carbohydrate quantities they had. Um, so we don't usually have very good data showing like where there could be differences in glycemic index and glycemic load. Um, so they look like they're in the same direction. Um, and then I should add for our, for our animal models, we kind of have the same effect on both of them um, because we're controlling them to make sure they have the identical amounts of carbohydrates. So the change, the difference in glycemic index is the same in our studies as the difference in glycemic load. Great, thanks. So um, one of the questions, and this has been asked um, several times, but variations on it. And it, it kind of, it's building from that where there's, um, you know, showing evidence that supports that the dietary patterns typically consumed in, you know, the U.S., right, um, is really tied to increased risks for um, 
you know, macular degeneration and other diseases. And the question then is, so if, if that's the case, right, could you talk about um, those same disease prevalence in other countries, right, or other cultures that have very different eating patterns, you know, is this where, um, you know, the Asian culture has a different profile risk versus Europeans, et cetera? That's, that's really interesting. I think it, it's so important that we try to do these dietary pattern studies in different geographic locations, um, just for these exact reasons. Um, so Asian populations have some interesting data about macular degeneration because um, they actually, I mentioned there's this wet form and this dry form. Um, in most Western countries, the dry form is more prevalent. Um, in Asian populations, it's the wet form that's more prevalent. And there's different relationships between dietary risk and the dry form and the wet form. Um, so not all of those studies translate across. Um, and you're right, I would, the Western dietary pattern is on increase everywhere, including in countries that traditionally didn't have those kinds of dietary patterns. Um, so even in Africa, um, we're seeing increases in adherence to Western diets. Um, but in countries um, that have a more kind of like Asian dietary pattern, um, there are sometimes similar relationships in that um, they can still be very high glycemic index. Um, so looking at increased rice consumption, which is often associated with a high glycemic um, quality to the diet. Um, so in some of those instances, um, we'll, we'll just have to look at them um, by different geographic regions. Um, what's interesting with the Mediterranean diet studies is that um, they've been repeated in four different locations, um, not in Asian countries, unfortunately, but Australia, US, Netherlands, and France. Um, and all of those have very different kinds of Mediterranean diets. Um, obviously, um, some areas have a lot more fish intake than others. Um, yet the associations have been like very robustly um, consistent throughout those different regions. So we hope that they're going to translate into areas that have different dietary patterns. Okay. Okay. Um, that, that kind of goes into an, another question here, which is, um, related to um, you know, unsaturated fats, especially oleic acid, which is the main fatty acid in olive oil, right? We're not associated with protection from um, AMD progression. And yet the Mediterranean diet's high on olive oil and kind of just commenting on that. Yeah, that, that's interesting. I, I thought about that as well. Um, one, one thing is that that study was based on an American cohort. Um, okay. So with less olive oil and more of our oleic acid intake is actually coming from high fat dairy products and from red meat. So oleic acid, yes, it is present in high amounts in olive oil, but it's also present in high amounts in a lot of other foods associated with the Western dietary pattern. Um, so my guess is if they did that study in a part of the Mediterranean, um, the, a country there that actually adheres to a high olive oil rich study, they may have found a different association. Okay, great, thanks. So Kelsey, question for you, okay? And this just has to do with, you know, what do you think is the inter, do you think that the interactions between the gut microbiome and eye disease are related to a specific species of bacteria or do you think it's much more about the relationship between different species of bacteria to each other? Yeah, so our we were actually talking about this this week on what our best guesses are on the mechanism between the my, uh, connecting the microbiome with the eye outcomes. Um, we expect that microbial metabolites are playing a large role um, and this can be like the tryptophan metabolites, for example. Um, and it, so in that case, we would specifically think that it's the microbes that are producing those metabolites and the microbes that are supporting those uh, metabolite producing bacteria that are then contributing to um, these health outcomes that we're observing. Um, there's probably, just generally having more of the fiber digesting bacteria, um, producing more shed chain fatty acids, just generally promoting health and reducing systemic inflammation throughout the body. Um, 
So in that way, it's more of a network thing of like keeping the stable community of fiber digesting bacteria. Um, and so um, I think it's a little bit of both. I think we have bacteria that are doing specific functions and bacteria that are just kind of promoting a healthy community. We have found in our research specific taxa that are associated with the positive health outcomes. I showed that earlier, and that's been consistent with other studies that we have done. We keep seeing those taxa come up as being associated with um, negative or positive outcomes in the retina. So yeah, a little bit of both, I think, would be the answer to that question. Great. Okay. So um, I'm going to go with one. I think it's going to be the last question. I might be able to squeeze in one more. Um, and this is about an eye disease that wasn't covered and it has to do with dry eyes. Okay. And the question is, you know, um, any thoughts about associations between nutrition and dry eyes? I can I can try to answer that. Um, dry I eyes was is, thinking you, that's one might go to you. Yeah, go ahead, Sheldon, please. Yeah, yeah. I, I didn't talk about dry eye disease. It, it actually probably would now qualify as an age-related eye disease, um, and its prevalence is going up. It goes up so much more in females and males. Um, but I think our best understanding of it is that it's um, it's really an inflammatory disease. Um, that affects the glands that are involved in, in tear production. It's an area of intense research. Um, and people have tried to make connections to um, nutrition. And I don't think those have been very particularly successful. So my guess is that there's probably some roles for general um, diet and affecting kind of your inflammatory status. Um, but there do seem to be like specific changes um, with age and again, mostly in um, and women um, that put them at higher risk for dry eye disease. Um, and, and, and there are new drugs that are being developed for it. It's actually like an area for enthusiasm in the future. And just to add to that, um, when I was researching different ocular diseases in the microbiome, looking at uveitis, a lot of the papers um, published on uveitis mention also um, eye disease. It seems like it's probably going to be a similar um, etiology and perhaps the ocular microbiome might be playing a larger role in dry eye disease. Great, thanks. So wanting to um, want, want, wanting to manage this well time-wise, I'll ask one last question, and this one's for um, for Kelsey, and it has to do with um, you know the the mice being kept germ free and management of antibiotics and how does that impact um, i think you understand the question based on you're already shaking the head could you just expand on that briefly and just to make sure i'm predicting what your question is that's referring to like accuracy of that model um yes. yeah okay so um, there are definite limitations to both the models of antibiotic ablation as well as the germ-free mouse. So the germ-free mouse does not have a microbiome for its entire life, and this has far-ranging effects on immune function. Um, so it, it's not just targeting the disease of interest. It becomes maybe not the best control. There's other differences that take place in that mouse. Um, it's good, but it has its limitations, especially when it comes to immune function. Um, there's definitely limitations to an antibiotic ablation of the microbiome, one of the key ones being that there are many antibiotic resistant bacteria. Um, and so you're not actually removing the, the microbiome, you're just removing the antibiotic sensitive microbiome. And the, many of our commensal bacteria are antibiotic sensitive and many of the pathogens present in the gut are resistant to antibiotics. Um, so this is a limitation I found in my own study where um, I didn't remove the microbiome, I kind of promoted a more inflammatory microbiome. Um, so I think there's still value um, and we can through bioinformatics tools um, specifically say, okay, removing this taxa has this effect, removing this taxa has this effect, the presence of this bacteria still being here has this effect. So we can kind of still parse out um, a role for the microbiome. But um, when I say that we are removing the gut microbiome, that is a very generous description of what's going on. Perfect. Perfect. So with that, um, we're going to start to go to the wrap up just um, to 
two last slides. Um, the the first being that we hope everybody can join us again in three weeks when we have our next um, webinar session on improving the health span of older adults through nutrition, which is going to focus on delaying cognitive delays. Um, and please, um, you know, the once you've registered for this webinar event, you will get registrations automatically for the next one. And my last slide is to thank um, our presenters today, Kelsey Smith and Sheldon Rowan. Um, I can tell you lots and lots of questions. So what you guys are doing is obviously very intriguing to a broader audience. So want to thank you guys and also want to thank our attendees for participating today and for engaging in the session.